One of the most common things you'll be asked to do as a new intern is replete your patient's electrolytes. Potassium, represented by the symbol K, is an important electrolyte for normal cardiac conduction and neuromuscular function, among other things. Patients may develop low potassium through many mechanisms. These include diuretic use, GI losses, renal losses, low dietary potassium or high sodium intake, and hypomagnesemia. In general, we define hypokalemia as a potassium level of less than 3.5 milliequivalents per liter. Those with lower levels of potassium may experience a range of symptoms. They may be asymptomatic or have vague symptoms of fatigue, muscle weakness, muscle cramping, or constipation. If potassium levels are very low, cardiac arrhythmias, paralysis, and respiratory distress can occur. There are also limitations in interpreting a serum potassium level. Pseudohypokalemia can occur when there is an excess of white blood cells in the sample. There are things that lead to cellular shifts of potassium, such as medications and acid-base disorders. If you suspect another disorder affecting serum potassium levels, make sure to target the underlying cause first. Let's now discuss a simple calculation to help you decide how much potassium to give. We need three pieces of information. One, the patient's goal potassium. Two, the patient's actual potassium level. And three, the patient's creatinine. This calculation works only when your units match the ones shown here. There are many formulas that can be used to calculate potassium chloride or KCL, but here is the one I use most commonly. Goal potassium minus actual potassium divided by the patient's creatinine. Then multiply by 100. This will give you the milliequivalence of potassium chloride to administer to your patient to get to your goal. To make it simple, if the patient's creatinine is less than one milligram per deciliter, just divide by one in this equation. Again, note that the potassium must be in milliequivalents per liter and creatinine must be in milligrams per deciliter. One question we haven't yet answered is, how do we determine the goal potassium? Treating asymptomatic hypokalemia with borderline or slightly low levels of potassium is controversial. In general, a reasonable goal is to normalize potassium levels to above 3.5 milliequivalents per liter. For those with active cardiac conditions, there are different goals depending on who you ask. Some recommend repleting to a goal of four for these patients. Others recommend a goal of 4.5 for those at especially high risk for ventricular arrhythmias. Let's do an example. The patient's serum potassium is 3.2 milliequivalents per liter. You want them to reach a goal potassium of 4.0 milliequivalents per liter. Their creatinine is two milligrams per deciliter. Now let's do the math. Let's recall the equation from before. Now we input our goal potassium of four, minus actual potassium of 3.2. Then divide by the patient's creatinine of two. Finally, multiply by 100. That gives us 40 milliequivalents of potassium chloride. Now let's talk logistics. Potassium chloride comes in multiples of 10 or 20 milliequivalent doses. So you have to round to the nearest 10 or 20 milliequivalents, depending on what's available at your hospital's pharmacy. Of course, the numbers don't always work out this neatly. In another example, the patient's potassium is 2.6 milliequivalents per liter. Their goal is 4 milliequivalents per liter. Their creatinine is 1.6 milligrams per deciliter. Now, let's do the math again. 4 minus 2.6 divided by 1.6 times 100. This gives us around 87 milliequivalents of potassium chloride. This is an awkward number to prescribe. You need to pick whether you're going to give 80 milliequivalents or 90 milliequivalents. Whether to choose the lower or higher dose option 
depends on how worried you are about undershooting or overshooting your goal. If your patient has been hypokalemic for several days and you anticipate ongoing potassium losses, you might choose the higher dose option. If you are worried that the patient's renal function will worsen, you might choose the lower dose option. Now let's talk about formulations. You can give potassium intravenously or orally. Here are some things to consider when figuring out which route you want. IV potassium can only be given 10 milliequivalents per hour through a peripheral IV. If you have a central line, it can be given at a rate of 20 milliequivalents per hour. IV potassium frequently causes pain and thrombophlebitis as it infuses peripherally. Alternatively, oral potassium is quicker to administer and is thus usually preferable if the patient can tolerate it. I say tolerate because the pills are huge, so they can be hard to swallow. In this case, the liquid formulation would be a better option, but keep in mind that patients often don't like the taste. Overall, there are many considerations for choosing the best route of potassium repletion for your patient. A good rule of thumb is to always attempt oral or enteral repletion first. Does your patient have a peripheral IV? Do they have a preference for the liquid formulation over the pills? Are they feeling nauseous and might vomit? Are you worried they won't absorb the potassium if taken orally? These are all questions I ask myself before deciding the best route to replete potassium. Sometimes you may even choose a combination of IV and oral. Lastly, you want to remember that magnesium is a cofactor for potassium uptake and regulation. If your patient also has hypomagnesemia, you may have difficulty repleting your patient's potassium. It's a good idea to also check a serum magnesium level in a patient with hypokalemia. So I hope you liked this video. Absolutely make sure to check out the course this video was taken from and to register for a free trial account which will give you access to selected chapters of the course. If you want to learn how MetMastery can help you become a great clinician, make sure to watch the About MetMastery video. So thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.